Well, hello, hello, hello. It is Monday night. It is time for the NX7062 podcast with me, your host, Stephanie Kay. Um, I am not with you tonight, as you can see down, whoop, down there. It says pre-recorded. The viewers have spoken. Everybody wanted a rebroadcast of my interview with Eric Pierpoint. He was probably one of the first really big enterprise gets uh, that I got. Gets that I got. Um, I have a friend who lives down in D.C. who the night I met him, he had mentioned to me that he was friends with Eric. I had started this podcast. He was kind enough to actually reach out to Eric on my behalf. And Eric was incredibly kind to agree to do it. And uh, like I said in my tweet earlier, we had the most amazing time um, chatting about so many things. And there's a reason why I'm wearing this shirt. And you will hear about that towards the end of the show. Um, you know, I miss you all. Um, real quick, I think we'll just chat about the Shuttle Pod show and Picard and all that when I'm live and we can interact and share our ideas and our thoughts and feelings about uh, the Shuttle Pod show. I will say, if you have not watched the Michael Westmore episode of the Shuttle Pod show, A, they didn't ask my question, unfortunately, which means maybe I'll just have to try and get him on my show myself so that I can ask him myself. Um, but if you, um, ah, brain freeze. But if you um, didn't watch it, watch it. We can talk about it next week along with uh, what's coming up next week with the Shuttle Pod Show. As soon as they announce their next guest, I think I know who it's going to be, but I don't want to say anything um, because with people's schedules, especially stuff changes in a heartbeat. So I don't want to spoil anything and announce who I think their guest is going to be and then have it turn out that they didn't have the person I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah. Oh, look. And I just noticed. Ha ha. Didn't turn this one off. Not that you shouldn't go to my Teespring store, but I did not mean for that to be rolling this entire time. But please, if you want to support the show and you just want to do it a one-off, go get some NX7062 merchandise. I designed all this stuff myself. I am still hoping to get permission to do an after-party uh, T-shirt, but Mark upgraded. Mark had their um, logo upgraded, so we'll see if I can get a hold of the upgraded logo and we can do an official after-party T-shirt uh, for Shuttle Pod Show. Uh, of course, as I said, the other place to go is Patreon. So please head over to Patreon um, if you'd like to support the show. Helps me get to conventions so that I can hopefully do some interviews. Um, I got a new device that I'm going to be testing later this week uh, to see if it's something I can take on the road with me and maybe do better than I did at the live event with Shell Pot Show because that was the first time I took my myself and my camera on the road. And did run into a couple of difficulties. My goal is obviously to send better quality live stuff than just on a phone. So um, I'm hoping the new purchase is what is going to help me out do that. But like I said, um, your support helps me uh, to bring you guys better stuff. Motion detected at the front door. Thanks, Alexa. Um, it helps me um, bring you guys better stuff. So everything that you guys do to support me, um, I love it. Thank you so much to all of my patrons out there and to the people that uh, helped fulfill my Amazon wish list um, and the camera um, and everything else. Um, but that's about it until next week. I hope you enjoy um, the Eric Pierpoint interview and the photos that I just kind of threw in there that I thought kind of fit um, and even some corrections. I did put in a couple of corrections. Um, yeah. So guys, listen, have a great rest of your week. Uh, I should be live next Monday. And until I see you all, don't forget, live long and prosper. Hey there, you know what? It is Monday night. That means it is time for the NX7062 podcast. Thank you, as always, for joining me on this adventure. I want to get through the housekeeping stuff, the stuff that I always do every week because I am so excited uh, to have my special guest on, and we're going to get to him in just a few minutes. But got a couple of big birthdays to announce today in Trek history. Um, J.G. Hertzler. Martok, my absolute favorite Klingon, you know, because, you know, he was the first guest on the NX7062 podcast. Uh, so that would be that would be why he's my favorite. Um, today is JG's birthday. So happy birthday, Chancellor. Um, 
Another person in Trek history, and there's a reason why I'm mentioning her, Leslie Parrish, who played Lieutenant Caroline Palmas on Who Mourns an Adonis, which was one of my personal favorite episodes. Um, And the reason that I want to bring up her birthday today uh, is because she penned or is attributed with the 1960s bumper sticker quote, Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. And when I saw that today in my uh, research, it reminded me the monkeys actually used that quote in a very little known song that they did uh, later in their um, incarnation when they were allowed to be a little more protesty, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, the monkeys use it in a, in a song in a song called Zora and Zam, and that's what caught my attention. Because, you know, Star Trek monkeys, let's, you know, bring some of my other fandoms into it. Um, the other birthday I'm going to mention doesn't happen until tomorrow. But since he's one of my favorite Star Trek people, I have to give a shout out to Connor Trenier. His birthday is March 19th. So those are our, the Trek birthdays uh that we've got going on next up let's talk about disco come on um we're going to start with the fact that i absolutely love the pacing this season they don't leave you in suspense too long they 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 let you go just enough to where you're like oh we got to see how this ends bam and you get it you get you you get what you asked for you get your ending you get your answers that just lead to more questions so it just keeps rolling along and i think that that's great uh spock and burnham i think it's intense and it's great to see Spock in this emotional, you know, human side of him coming out because Michael hurt him as a child and he he can't let it go. And there's a lot of unresolved issues and the way he got in her face this week I thought was really was really pretty great. Um, a lot of people are getting on Michael's case because she disobeyed order or she didn't send Arium, you know, she didn't send her friend into space when she was ordered to by Captain Pike. But can we not understand that? And the basic um, principle of the whole thing is how many other people have gone against orders, have ignored orders? A lot. Why is everybody getting on Michael's case just because she didn't want to sentence her friend to death? I think anybody, any good soldier in that situation would still have a problem pulling the trigger or pushing the button or doing anything. So come on, people. Let's, let's get over that one. Um, and the other thing, and this is going to lead us right into my very special guest for the evening, um, Section 31 was under attack from a computer, nonetheless. Um, sort of had kind of shades of Skynet for me, but it was still very interesting what was going on. And um, the reason that Section 31 is so important to tonight is because my guest is Eric Pierpoint. Eric, Hello. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. I'm great. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have one person in the chat rooms tonight, and his name is Robert. He is my loyal listener, and he says good evening to you as well. Hi, Robert. How you doing? Can I hear you? Uh, no, it's all chat, so he can all hear chat. you. I don't understand these things, so you just lead me along. <laughs> anyway, how you doing, Robert? <laughs> um, thank you, Eric, so much for being with us. Um, and we are definitely going to be talking about Section 31 at some point this evening. Um, but I kind of wanted to go over your CV a little bit, but kind of get people to get to know you outside of Star Trek. Sure. Because, I mean, first of all, you did tell me uh, yesterday you you were a fan. That, of course, you did watch the original series. Oh, yeah. When I was in college, uh, in, okay, 60s, this weird show started up and everybody was talking about it. And I didn't really take note of it until I was like a freshman in college, which was a long freaking time ago. And my roommate and I used to go and we'd have dinner and we'd get the uh, Star Trek reruns, black and white, tiny little television in the dorm room. And we just became obsessed about it. We had to run to catch like the whatever rerun was on that night. And uh, I remember one day, you know, he said to me, and this is before I really was even thinking about becoming an actor. Um, he said, wouldn't it be great to be on a show like that someday? Said, yeah, that'd be great. You know, and then, well. <laughs> <laughs> How prophetic. And we didn't even know. But you're, according to IMDb, now I know that your career could have started well before that. But according to IMDb, your first credit was back in 1984. And uh, then, What are you looking at? Do you see uh, it in front of you? Um, actually, I don't. I have to admit, I didn't write down what your first credit on IMDb was because what? Oh, com- I, 
Okay, I'll tell you what I think it might have been was a movie called Windy City. And it was a kind of a, a different take on sort of the big chill kind of a movie about a bunch of guys in their 30s in Chicago. And, uh, you know, one of them is terminally ill. And I, I was one of the, uh, you know, main characters in that. And uh, so we shot in Chicago for about, oh, about two months. And then right after that, I was, there, since it was my first movie, uh, I got a lot of interest. I was living in New York at the time. Uh, I kept flying out to Los Angeles, and my agent there had me going around town on five meetings a day. It was crazy time. And I eventually fairly quickly actually probably the next year i think 1984 was hot pursuit which a uh, was a fugitive type series and the same executive producer as who later produced alien nation uh so and he he and i became very good friends and that was a great experience i we did uh just about a year's worth of episodes and then it was um it was canceled unfortunately it's the same time as miami vice came out uh, and other popular shows at the time, like Cosby Show and all that, on NBC. So, yes, that's kind of where it all started. Well, what and you're at, and then you did some Hill Street Blues because I I pulled you up. But now, what caught my eye was you were already doing sci-fi in '86. You did Invaders from Mars. Oh yes, um, the remake, kind of a re- or a reinvention of Invaders from Mars. Uh, I had something drilled into the back of my neck, and then I ended up, you know, uh, flipping out, and my troops shot me to put me out of my, my misery. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a hoot. But, um, yeah, and then um, we were talking, and the one thing I love about, it's my podcast, which means when I go over somebody's profile on IMDb, I get to talk about the shows that I like that they of did. Course. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can torture me with it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, skipping ahead a little bit, right, uh, not too long before you got Alienation, a couple years before you got Alienation, you did do an episode of Beauty and the Beast. Yes. yes which I did. we were talking about. Um, one of my favorite shows. And again, not, not science fiction, but definitely a fantasy show. Absolutely. Uh, it's interesting that, that um, there were a lot of... Uh, female fantasy <laughs> reaction to that show. You can you can inform me about that. <laughs> about the beast. <laughs> oh, you know, it's for me it was all about that voice. Ron uh-huh. Perlman had such a beautiful voice. Yes. And and he would read poetry. I mean, what woman wouldn't want to hear that voice reading her poetry? Matter I mean and dressed as basically a lion in makeup, whatever. Yes. And and yes. always ri- and always riding to the rescue. Uh, I know it's great, and what woman doesn't want an? I don't know. I, I should probably shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, and I mean, look at this. I mean, that was. I mean, George R. R. Martin. Come on. I mean, look where he is now. Well, a lot of these shows were amazing. What uh, you know, actors kind of go through on various guest starring roles or recurring roles on on shows that launch their careers uh, it, it's it's incredible i mean you know, i know you might talk about this later but alienation was one of those kind of launch pads for a number of them uh, and they who went on and are still working you know to do amazing amazing things yes well, yeah and um and the other thing we talked about right before we went on the air was um just for a trivial standpoint trivia standpoint i should say not trivial um well, thank you okay <laughs> Uh, trivia trivia standpoint beauty and the beast you jeffrey combs and armin shimmerman all end up being star trek alumni and you were all on beauty and the beast even though there wasn't the same episodes you were all right. on beauty and the beast. i see them uh periodically like las vegas at you know there's a star trek convention there <gasps> there's a star trek convention in las vegas <laughs> <laughs> oh really oh know? really I inform you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the tip yeah, you might try it sometime. I might just have to. Uh, maybe this August. I don't know. Might be I have, free. I have, a, I have a funny uh, convention story for you. Um, okay, so I think it's what's it called? Uh, the, there's a Baltimore convention, Shore Leave. I think it's called. Is that right? Oh, uh, there is no. one in in Maryland called Shore Leave. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 
this is kind of like I'm, I'm getting this sort of images in my mind that's freewheeling right now, but I was doing, was it an episode of, was I doing a Klingon then, Kortar? Anyway, so I fly back uh, for shore leave, and there was this blizzard that happened. It snowed about three feet, and everyone was trapped inside the hotel. No one could get out. The National Guard was out preventing anybody from going, trying to go anywhere. And, of course, at conventions, people dress as whatever favorite character they want to dress as. And it really became like the Star Wars bar. <laughs> People's makeup and costumes were, like, melting in front of you. Oh, my God. I'm- spending three days trapped in a, in a blizzard. And they're running out of food, and you're in the bar, and there's like bar snacks and booze. <laughs> what could go wrong, right? <laughs> so as long as the Klingons were all getting along, I guess you were okay. You no, know, people were had still had like a little bit of battery left in the lightsabers and everything. But I mean, they were out in the snow, and you'd see like people like, dressed in Star Wars stuff doing lightsaber stuff, and uh, in the snow, it was pretty. <laughs> Pretty weird. <laughs> that definitely one of the better Star Trek stories that, or convention stories, I should say, that I've heard. That is amazing. Um, you elbows with with the fans, and they're like buying you drinks, you know, and you're like, okay, where's my room? <laughs> yeah, this is true. If you're if you are if you're a celebrity and you're sitting in the bar, chances are you're not going to have to pick up a tab. Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, but yeah, not like I said, like two years after uh, Beauty and the Beast, you, you you ended up on Alien Nation. And the one thing that I want to tell you, um, I, I loved Alien Nation. I actually could still sing the theme song. But anyway, um, not that I'm going to, but I still know the words. Um, <laughs> but the, the one thing that I love about it when I sit down and, and I think about it is, um, besides the chemistry that you and Gary Graham had, um, was just the innocence that you and Michelle portrayed with Susan and George. There was such an innocence to your characters because you never, you know, you were experiencing all of this for the first time. Yeah. And I just, I loved seeing that portrayed in the episode, you guys getting, just getting to know our planet and know our people. And I always thought that that was just one of my favorite parts of the show. Well, that show was so inventive inventive on so many different levels right the world's mm-hmm. newest minority a whole new culture that you're trying to adjust to and then still try to hang on to some of yours and the dynamic between george and susan uh was such that um and the son buck holding on to our traditions and george was trying so hard to assimilate and his way of doing it was to try to, you know, just be as upbeat and nice and, you know, to adjust. And he had his times where he had a lot of other, uh, you know, parts of his personality. But working with uh, Gary was a lot of fun because we got to this point where there was definitely a rhythm. Um, And it's, we just had, we just laughed all the time. You could that's how that's how you can do it when you're you've been in makeup since three thirty in the morning. <laughs> you know you have to be to laugh. Of course, Gary rolled in at six thirty and just brushed his teeth, and that was it. You know, right? And, and he was ready for camera. Um, but it was um, such an incredibly inventive show. Um, we had great writers, wonderful producer directors and and the cast was just so much fun um and michelle and i had a great time uh, acting together and and being the sort of the the cement of the family um and gary was there obviously for just comic relief you know <laughs> well you know it's funny um you know that that, that vegas thing that you mentioned i i had a chance to um to meet gary last year he was there and, you know, I walked up to him and the first thing out of my mouth was, you know, Enterprise is my favorite show, but um, I loved Alien Nation. And he, for some reason, seemed surprised that I recognized him when he was playing a Vulcan. I'm like, still pretty obvious who you were. Um, but, and I, and I told him the same thing, you know, that I loved the chemistry between 
the two of you. And he said something, if I remember correctly, that the producers told you guys to kind of pal around together before you even started filming to kind of... Oh, get- yeah. Yeah, we did. We went off together. In fact, uh, this is not the easiest thing when Ken Johnson, who is the executive producer and a great friend, uh, said, so, uh, Eric, um, we're going to put you in makeup and we're going to give you a driver and you and Gary go off and uh, walk around L.A. <laughs> okay? All right. So I'm in makeup, and I, I we haven't even shot anything yet. And we go into Union Station, which is a train station. And we get in there, and we're walking around, and I'm in a suit with my bald, spotty head, and Gary's doing, you know, whatever he's, Sykes would be wearing. And, you know, I, I remember a woman looked at me and, and looked at somebody else and said, oh, my God, that man's got burns all over his head. <laughs> you know? And then I went up to another uh, another person. I think it was a woman again. And I, I, she, I looked at her, and she looked at me, and she said, like, what are you? What are you? I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Looking at me like, I said, I have no idea what you mean. Well, your head. I go, I'm sorry, I'm not getting that. <laughs> And then you would find like the uh, the other uh, the people who are so used to Hollywood going. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's alienation, right? I saw the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and that that were you at all worried? I mean, had you seen in the movie before the show? Yeah, I, I saw. Actually, I saw the film. I liked it. And uh, when Kenny uh, called me because he was, as I said before, uh, the creator and executive mm-hmm. producer of Hot Pursuit. He said, I want you to do, a, you know, be in the new series, a new pilot, uh, Alien Nation. I said, oh, yeah, I, I saw the movie. And I, he said, yeah, think, you know, here, just watch it again and, and we'll talk. Get back to me. And I watched it, you know, and I thought, that's great. And, you know, I'm, okay. So I call him up and I said, okay, great. You know what? I'd love to play Sykes. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. Uh, no, you're, you're going to play George. And I said, let me watch it again. <laughs> so I watched it again, and I said, well, of course I'm going to play George. Because I, it was, uh, I took it as a, a real uh, challenge of the imagination. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd done a lot of classical theater. I worked on a master's degree, got that, and studied British comedy and Shakespeare and everything. And I thought, you know what? I can put elements of these different plays, genres, or whatever into this character because who's to say an alien can't have all these various aspects? And so that's what really became fun is like, oh, wow, okay. That, so that's why there's kind of different, you know, a, there was a balance of, of – uh, say, British comedy versus uh, Tennessee Williams versus this or that. It's a little bit like, you know, the, the movie Galaxy Quest? Yep. Uh, where it's just Tim Allen and, and Alan Rickman. And I, when I saw that movie, I went, you know, I, listen, I was, you know, Alan Rickman that part before he did it. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, three, four, five curtain calls. Come on. You know? Well, and what's really interesting is obviously it's it's an it's topical. Alien Nation is very topical today oh, to what's going on. I mean, I've, I've watched a few episodes uh, lately just out of curiosity to see how it would hold up. Mm-hmm. And the stuff that I was watching was so appropriate to what's going on in the world right now. If you watch some of these episodes about, um, okay, for example, the Purist Society the political uh, group that was all about trying to uh, basically exterminate the aliens in Alien Nation. Uh, Wow. I mean, look what's been going on in the news. Mm -hmm. Uh, So even 28 years ago now, or or mid-90s, let's say, or 23 years. Right. Uh. They were getting it back then, and you're watching it appear on the news. Immigration, 
right? Mm-hmm. This whole it's all this stuff about immigration. Wow, it's amazing that that what we're going through now in this country, and what was what we were talking about then with the you know imprisoning, uh, killing, exterminating the newest uh, minority, and you know I I thought that we had a lot of room left to grow. Uh, and we could have, and it would have been interesting to see. And if they, if it's reinvented or reimagined now, of course, Sykes and I would be in like a few years from going into assisted living, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we might show up for, for the odd recurring, uh, you know, episode. But um, they keep talking about they're going to do something and and reimagine it with different actors or whatever. But I never see it happen. Yeah, you know, a lot. I think for some reason that seems to be a trend lately. Is is you know finding the best of TV from back then and and maybe doing reboots. But yeah. I mean, I'm such. I, I I don't know. I I find it hard with stuff like that because you know you fall in love with these original characters and the original actors that played them. And sometimes sometimes it works. But I mean, I think it's a, it's a big risk to yeah, take. Most of the time I don't think it, most of the time I don't think it works. Yeah, I mean they're they, they're redoing Hellboy without Ron Perlman and I'm not sure I want to go see that movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean there's some things that I mean a franchise like Star Trek can reinvent itself into different I guess uh series concepts, but mm-hmm. it's still Star Trek. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. not, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um well I was just going to say on a, on a lighter note um before we get into Star Trek, something else that you did that that I just watched this today, actually, and I didn't get a chance to finish watching it because uh, before we got on. But Allie McBeal, the character that you play in Allie McBeal, also had something that was that's kind of topical today because what you were portraying in Allie McBeal back in 97 was a thruple. Yeah, right. I don't see anything wrong with a man being trying to be married to two women at the same time. Do you? No, I don't. And the way, I mean, the way that they were presenting it, it made perfect logical sense. A legal argument, right? Yes. Right. Le- the science based in science that men are wired to spread their seed to multiple partners to keep the human race going. Thank what- you. What a logical argument. And, you know, and I just thought, you know, now a days when every when there's a lot of talk about redefining relationships, David, mm. you know, David E. Kelly had it wired back then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, when you're doing other shows like this and you're as a guest star, it's always interesting to see, you know, if you're kind of one of the actors that sort of is in an episode that sort of you know, kind of pushes the envelope a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I love that stuff. I, I think it's fun to go in like that and shake something up. Um, there's, you know, it, it's just a, it's a hoot when you go, oh, wait a minute, I'm an Irish terrorist, but wait, he's sort of bipolar. Okay, wait a minute. Now um, I want to be married to, to two women at the same time. Okay. And that's kind of a hip show. Absolutely. And, I love it. I, I just, um, you know, that we do a lot of regular stuff, stuff that's more conservative, or kind of like on the nose that you get hired for. I mean, I, I remember the year of the police chief where I think I was three, you know, shows, three police chiefs on three different shows. I remember <laughs> the year of the fire chief where I was like fire chief of three to, on three different shows, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like... Well, wow, what is it? What, what shirt? I must be wearing the right shirt to go to the audition. There's, you know. <laughs> well, the, and then and then the the last thing I want to I have to mention before we we get into the Star Trek thing is the silk stockings because that yes. was definitely yeah. my guilty pleasure back in the nineties. Uh huh. Okay. Well, apparently it was a lot of other people's guilty pleasures too because I think I mentioned the story to you where yep. I'm at Dodger, Dodger Stadium and I'm. They're watching the game, and like right around the third inning or something, and I hear this murmuring, and it was packed, and it was murmuring in my section. And like, whisper, 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 and I get a glance here and a glance there, and I'm thinking, oh, I've been recognized for something. I just can't figure out what it is. And I'm thinking, oh, it's got to be this or it's got to be that. And then finally this woman behind me said, uh, you're that guy, aren't you? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? 
you know, and it turned out to be silk stockings. <laughs> so I, I, it could have been like, you know, when you do, here's the funny thing about doing a hit show. If you do a hit show, uh, whether it's yours or someone else's, and you're in the grocery store line, people just want to talk to you. They want to catch up on what's going on in the show. And then let's say you do one that people have no clue about. But I never thought, really, that, that Silk Stockings was the kind of a show where you get stopped in the street. It was, it was kind of funny and bizarre at the, all at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I told you when we were having this conversation before we went live, I was like, yeah, it must be like one of five people that watch that show. And you're like, no, no maybe six or seven. Yes, there's probably, you know, 20,000 people in that stadium who watched it. <laughs> you know, who it's nice to know I wasn't alone. No, so you, everyone else is denying it, and so were you. So <laughs> now, now you're open about it because enough time has passed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was it was a really good show. I really enjoyed it. In fact, um... The guy that played the lead, uh, her mm-hmm. partner, um, he actually used to be in my soap opera. I think that's why I ended up starting to watch it, and then I just got hooked. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. That's Yeah, that's why I feel I, I'm one of those people. It's like if I have an actor from a show that I like, and then and they turn around and they show up somewhere else, I tend to follow them just to see what else they're doing. It was a fun show. You know, it was one of those uh, lower-budget shows that shot in San Diego, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. I can't remember how many I did, but a bunch of them. Yeah, well, see, this is the, the magic of IMDb. It looks like you did eight episodes. Okay, that's a bunch. That is. That's a good, that's a steady recurring. Sure. Yeah, that's that's respectable. But you it's know what? The, I, it's okay. It's not the year that I was uh, almost killed off on three different shows at the same time. <laughs> what year was that? Well, do you want to hear that story? Okay. Sure. I was recurring as police chief on Parks and Recreation. I was recurring as uh, father of one of the stars on Heart of Dixie. And I did an episode of Workaholics. All right. So they all air that winter. And I'm looking at the scripts and go, oh, okay. So I was given a heart attack on Heart of Dixie but survived. I was retired on Parks and Recreation, and I was set on fire <laughs> in Workaholics. Okay, so it was pretty rough. That was a rough, rough winter, I have to tell you. Yeah, unlike Alienation, where they just kept bringing you guys back in movies. Like, they That's just right. couldn't get Does, enough of you. Does he have a pulse? Let's get Eric in makeup. <laughs> there you go. In fact, um, Eileen, who's just joined us in chat, said she saw you... And uh, Gary, at the 2013 uh, Vegas convention, you guys had an Alien Nation panel. Okay. I'm I'm thank you for saying that. It's a long time ago. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just surprised Creation let you guys talk about something other than Star Trek. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, they, they do because they know that there's still some Alien Nation fans out there. But we, we really go for, uh, you know, the Star Trek uh whole thing and i've done all of them except okay. for you know shatters uh, yeah. and Leonard anymore well you you were you were a baby back then right uh yes i was <laughs> <laughs> you were too young let's just say that well there you go thank you obviously you're not looking at imdb right now are you i am and i'm lying through my teeth for you because you're my guest thank you so much i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but back in 1993, you did make your very first Star Trek appearance on Next Generation. Yes, as the ambassador of love from the planet Iaria. Mm. And I'll tell you a funny thing about that is that the first thing I'll say is that uh, they had originally read me for the Riker role, and that didn't work out because I, I'm coming off the series of Alienation. Uh, they used to see me for a lot of different like sci-fi leads in Star Trek but I went in to do um, Voval and uh, which is an interesting name given these the ambassador of love and um, uh, my whole thing was to seduce Picard okay so I'm reading it and at one point it says 
Volval turns into a woman. And I'm thinking, uh, this is pretty advanced for Star Trek or me to think that, how am I going to pull this off? Because I truly make like the ugliest woman <laughs> on the planet. So are they going to put a wig on me? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? <laughs> and then what happens, right? Well, obviously they they cast um, an actress, uh, Barbara Williams, to play me. And I was grateful for that because she looks great as a woman. <laughs> You know, but we did our our whole thing, and I really enjoyed working with Patrick Stewart. He was such a, a, I don't know, he's just a super guy. Yeah, and very open and very present, and you know, re- such a pro and everything. You could say go on and on about him, um, and I, that was a really fun experience. I enjoyed that a lot. And once again, they stuck you in makeup. Not a whole lot of makeup. So it, it was, was it was easier than Alien Nation makeup. Oh God, yes, yeah, yeah. Nothing was covering my ears. It was like a bumpy forehead and a little thing on the nose. I think. Yeah, yeah. Next Gen did like their ridges. They really did like to get their yeah, so they, and you get like a Fabian haircut or something, and there you, you go. Know, then you like high like a hike it to Jesus haircut or something. Whatever. And then after that, you did. Um, there were there was more George Francisco in your future after that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, there was another five movies. Yeah, and then in ninety uh, seven is when you ended up playing Captain Sanders in For the Uniform. Yes, and again, uh, when they were looking for the uh, the lead in a role that Avery Brooks got, uh, they saw me, and I think even I, I kind of think that. Maybe Gary Graham was up for it as well. I'm not. I can't quite remember exactly, but uh, but it was time for them to go the direction that that they did definitely, and uh, so obviously didn't get that. And um, but down the road they they said uh, we'd like to give you a guest starring role as Captain Sanders, and the, and I thought great, I love it. I'm, thank you. I'm a, I'm now I've got my my ship that unfortunately got shot out from <laughs> because of probably a bad decision I made. Uh, maybe that's why I wasn't, you know, ultimately, you know, <laughs> the regular captain. But, <laughs> but I really liked the uniform. <laughs> but also appearing as a hologram and all of that, that was really fun too, you know. Right. Uh, that, that was a hoot. Yeah, I enjoyed that. But I I, I like that very much, and I, I guess that leads us into uh, Klingon territory. Yes, um, but again, you know, it's it's just so it's so interesting to be sitting here and looking at the CV online and seeing like alienation, alienation, Star Trek, alienation, alienation. Because you did you did another movie right after Deep Space Nine. You did another alienation movie in the same year. Oh, okay. So I've do- never really triangulated that before. I have to look at that. But I guess it's the years of sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's also you know when. I mean, Star Trek was really heating up and doing a lot of reinventions, and and um, uh, it was like, um, uh, of course, a, such a, a terrific uh, big fish to land if you got so lucky, uh, and I'm sure everybody feels that way. You know, doing getting a regular role on Star Trek, it's it's history. It's sort of historical, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you you didn't. You you did one episode of Voyager, but you want to talk history? You played the first Klingon. I know. I loved it. I I actually, um, God, when they, when they hired me for that, and I thought, well, you know, finally I get to be a Klingon. This is great news. And we shot. I remember the first uh, day on a Friday, I think, and then I had to do a convention. I think it was even shore leave. And there was a, a rough, uh, you know, boy, I, we were doing it, but the plane that um, I was returning to shoot first thing Monday morning uh, had a problem, had a mechanical. And then they had a fueling issue. And I flew in. I landed in L.A. at uh, midnight. My call time was 2.30 a.m to get into Klingon makeup. Okay, so I go directly 
to Paramount. I get there. They spent all this time making me up, and then we shoot. And we shot, and we shot, and we shot all day. And then we shot 23 hours because they had to finish off that particular episode as they were going into the next episode. So, and we were shooting on the poor, and then like a poor man's process, which was the barge of the dead, back and forth. So it was rolling all the time. And then um, what happened after we wrapped, and it was, of course, like, I don't know, three in the morning or some crazy thing. And um, I got pulled over on the freeway trying to get home by the cops who said, we pulled you over because you were weaving. Have you been drinking? I said, no, I've been a Klingon. <laughs> so I had, I was still in the black shirt. I had ball, like little balls of like makeup on me, hanging off of me. Uh, I had my script next to me. And, you know, he did the like, okay, follow my finger thing. And he said, you think you can find your way home? Like what, to my planet? And I said, yeah, I can get home. He says, okay. Well, I can't give you a ticket for driving while Klingon. Okay. You know, only in L.A., right? Absolutely. But I will say, though, that I love that episode. Um, I, I Something about being in su- that makeup and then in, when you're doing a lot of prosthetic makeup, uh, you know, roles, which I've done, what's really great about that is you – really lose your identity as to who you are walking around. And then your, your recreation of this character, you you feel more liberate, like, like the freedom to create something new, but using the, you know, your craft. So you kind of look at yourself and you, you see the whole thing and then you try, you know, you're working on, okay, How does he walk? How does he talk? How does he behave? It's great character work. Um, And then there's also that, I guess, that historical value of being the, I guess, the oldest Klingon. Uh, But just that, um, I, I, there were a lot of really good scenes in there, I felt. Uh, And I enjoyed the heck out of it as as crazy a, a shoot as that was. I got a lot out of it. You know, I really did. So I was grateful for it. Um, actually, and you know what, Robert, that he said that was his favorite of your roles in Star Trek. He really enjoyed your work with Roxanne Dawson. Um, but I think Robert's a little biased because Robert cosplays as General Martok. So he's a huge fan of the Klingons. So okay. Well, a little biased, but. Uh, totally fine with me. That's. <laughs> Robert, thank you for that. <laughs> um, as we're getting ready, because see, now we're moving into my favorite, because like I, I've said, like everybody who listens to this podcast knows Enterprise is my favorite out of all of them, out of all the series. And that's where we're, we're heading right now. But I have to tell you that a Robert Harris told me this story on Facebook. He said he actually wrote to Rick Berman when he was a kid before Enterprise um, and he said it was the general fan mail schmaltzy I love Star Trek kind of letter. Um, but he said in the end he was cheeky enough to ask if a character could be named after him so he could say that some part of him was involved in the franchise. And, of course, you know, he figured, oh, I'm just going to ask, but it's nothing's ever going to happen. And then flash forward, and here is Harris, the leader of Section 31 in oh, Enterprise. Yeah. All right. So All he... Right. He obviously doesn't know whether or not, you know, Rick Berman did that, but he always thought it was kind of cool that a uh, character named Harris did actually show up. And I'm grateful that he showed up. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you try out for anybody on Enterprise? You said you had, you had read for some... Well, okay, so I was in a uh, uh, another episode before I did the Harris role. Yes. Uh, Okay, so you, Sherat, I guess his name is? Yep, from Rogue Planet. Okay, so eating intelligent game on the dark planet. Uh, so I got my feet wet there. We had, uh, I guess, um, alien barbecue. And yep. um, 
Yeah. And that was, uh, I, I'm not, maybe you know this, but I heard that it was, uh, sort of a take on an old, could have been either an outer limits or a star or a twilight zone episode or, or concept where that there was some kind of intelligent game hunting and a moral problem with that. Um, but after that, uh, I got called in again, but here's the deal. I got called in for another Klingon role and I went in to meet with them. And after I finished reading for the Klingon role, they did one of these hang on moments where they talked among themselves and they said, Eric, would you mind just looking over this other part? And I thought, huh, well, I've already been a Klingon. Maybe it's, there's a bit of a conflict there. I don't know. So I went out in the hall and I read a couple of scenes to myself for maybe 15 minutes. And I went in and met with them and read it. And next thing I know, I'm on the set uh, to play Harris. And I thought, okay, now what is Section 31? And what am I, you know, what am I doing? I mean, they basically gave me sort of a brief description uh, in the meeting of what it was. And believe it or not, there was like a, in like a set security guy there who was a real Star Trek fan. And he started talking to me as I was heading into makeup because he said, okay, you're here to do this. I go, yeah, okay. And he started to talk to me about Section 31. I go, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. And wardrobe people are like trying to fit me into another actor who had played sec a guy in Section 31 before who was a little skinnier than me and was trying very hard to like fit the leather outfit. <laughs> <laughs> the one from Deep Space Nine, yeah. Yes, so. Um, and um, somehow they crammed me into it. Uh, and I'm got, you know, got dressed, I had, was prepared, go in and start shooting. And it was like, it turned out really cool. I, you know, I enjoyed it. I was like, um, what is it, like four episodes or something? You have the IMDb in front of you? How many oh, I don't, do? oh, it's it's Enterprise. You think I need, I know, it, it was four episodes. Yeah. You, yeah, you did um, the two-part episode. Actually, there was two two-part episodes. You did Affliction and Divergence and then Demons and Terror Prime. Okay. okay. Um, and what was really, and this I have to, this was funny because last night when you and I were trying to figure out Skype to make sure that you could be on the call tonight, I was actually catching up on my Enterprise. I hadn't watched Demons and Terror Prime in a while, so I wanted to watch it. And, you know, it's that moment when you're watching Demons and Eric Pierpoint emails you and said, Can you help me out? With <laughs> <laughs> Can you help me out with Skype? Skype. And I'm like, um, Yeah, sure, Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh, I'm an actor, right? Right. <laughs> I was just like, I just thought the timing was just so perfect on that. that that's totally perfect. Like, actually, I could see you anyway. Mm. I was just testing you. Yeah, exactly. But those were, I mean, those were pretty. Those were pretty intense episodes. Um, yeah. And you know, while I was doing the research for the podcast, you know, and and I don't know how how much they told you about this, but. Section 31 was Iris, um, Steve and Ira Bear's idea, and it was based off of some, a line that Cisco actually had, where he said, it's easy to be a saint in paradise. Mm -hmm. And it just leads to, well, okay, so how do you keep paradise as paradise? Somebody's got to do the dirty work. There's got to be, you know, some underlying, nobody really needs to know why everything's so perfect. And mm -hmm. that's where Section 31 comes in. You know, but, and I mean, it was such a secret. It was a secret in Deep Space Nine. Nobody knew about it. It was a secret in Enterprise, except, you know, for Malcolm, who was, you know, had been a recruit of yours. Nobody knew about it. And mm -hmm. now, like, Discovery, it's sort of kind of out there. I hear that it's going, it might pick up steam. Is that what you hear, too? Yeah, I, they're, they're already talking about a Section 31 spinoff. With okay. with the one character, it's just you know they were working so hard in um, they were working so hard in Deep Space Nine and Enterprise to keep it as a covert right. section, 
But it just seems like everybody seems to know Section 31 now in Enterprise. Yeah, it's not so cool. Or in, dis- in Discovery, it's yeah, it's just sort of out there. Um, but that, that actually leads to a question um, from the internet that I got from... Which one am I looking for? Oh, this one's from Ernesto. I actually told him he could ask two questions since there's no time limit on how long we're going to sit here and talk to everybody. Um, but one of them was... Um, how do you feel about the division in fans? You know, now between Discovery and the J.J. Abrams movies and the original timelines, it seems to have divided the fan base. Uh, I wish I could answer that because I don't under- I don't know what that mm-hmm. feels like uh, because um, I I know that so often fans are so much more uh, I guess up to date on everything mm-hmm. Star Trek. Right. Right. And it's um, I feel like as an actor, uh, I'm a bit of a of a gypsy. I love Star Trek and I would love to go in and do something else on a regular basis with Star Trek. Uh, I the fan division to me sort of started off as a an idea like, okay, so they go from from Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and that rang. How could you possibly dare to venture into next generation? Right? So there was like a, a whole th- thing. Well, that worked out. And all throughout uh, the Star Trek history, it always seems to work out. So maybe Ernesto can uh in, you know, can inform me in some way as how what he thinks that division might be or why, because that would educate me. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because again, we were we when we were fixing Skype last night, we had this conversation. Um, what sometimes fans don't realize is, and it's nobody's fault. I mean, they're so invested. And they might have seen an episode, you know, four, five, ten, twenty times. And I told you the story. I was, I happened to be standing with and talking to Connor Trenier, um in 2017 in Vegas. And a fan came up and they said to him, hey, you remember that episode where you swung from the tree? And he's like, no. No. <laughs> no. Because between actors shooting things completely out of sequence... And the fact that he did it, you know, 15, 16 odd years ago, however long ago it was, and he may not have seen it then. I mean, you know, you might have just watched it yesterday, but for an actor who's a gypsy who moves from one place to another, it's not that you didn't love the work. It's another way to answer it. Another way that I, you know, because you could ask me all kinds of questions about uh, a show that was what I would consider my show, okay? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, like Alien Nation. Uh, if I were, uh, you know, uh, Patrick Stewart, Avery Books, or, you know, whatever, uh, who was a regular, I would know a ton about everything that I'm doing on that show, the progressions, the scripts, everything. So as Star Trek, real true Star Trek fans are watching all the time, every show. And they, they, it's a passion, you know. It's a whole passion, like obviously, and, and your passion too. So I watch them, I love them, I appreciate them. Um, but I'm also, uh, I, I'm a novelist. I write um, historical fiction for younger readers. Uh, I do other things, um, and I'm called in for meetings. Like if if somebody from Star Trek or Discovery calls me, uh, you know, my agent and says, I'd love to see you for this part. We want to keep uh, Section 31 going. Or, you know what, we've got another Klingon role for you or whatever. I'd be all about it. And that's kind of where it goes. But when when that episode or your your part in, in that project is over, uh, then you are also investing yourself in other possibilities as an actor as i say this is gypsy life absolutely um but as the gypsy who has been in four different star treks ernesto also wanted to know if you had a favorite cast and crew oh Uh, well (laughs) i know who i'm voting for but go ahead it's your question okay so that's (laughs) 
Okay, I, I'm going to have to say in in my way, Enterprise, only because I was there four times. Yay! Okay, I was there four times. All right, then I'm uh, not hanging up on you. All right. Okay, thank you. That's I did that, you know, for political expediency. But mm-hmm. you know, I, I, um, you got to know people when you're on multiple times. It then becomes family. Okay, if you're on one episode, which maybe shot one week, three days, six days, whatever, you're there, and it's, you know, it's wonderful, and then then you go home, and you're off to the next thing. But when they actually call you in, then it's be, then you start to learn about everybody. You learn about the crew. You learn about. You know, you talk to them, you know, their families, you talk to the director, you're talking to the other actors, you have, uh, you know, there's there's more of uh, this sort of human uh, energy and by play that that makes you feel like you're part of the part of everything. Uh, and that's the way it is when you're doing like a, a regular a regular role, a series lead or something like that. The tone is set from the moment you walk in to how you want that day to be and all of the, I, it might sound corny, but there's a lot of love going around uh, for people who are enjoying what they're doing. I know the Star Trek people, I'm sure, are like that. Um, you know, it's a family. And, Absolutely. You know, so that's how I feel about that. If, if I had done uh, six episodes as Cortar, then it w- that would have been a different experience, but um, I'm sure a terrific one, you know. So right. So I guess that kind of answers the second part of his question. Uh, Ernesto's question was, which writer did you feel did the best job with character development? But I think you'd have to go back and not to put words in your mouth, but Enterprise is the one that you actually got to develop the character a little more because you were in four episodes playing one character as opposed to. I, I would go with that, but I also think that uh, Cortar. Okay. Uh, that there was a lot put into that that uh, was a challenge. I appreciated that. I would like to have, uh, ex- you know, I would like to have done more as that character as well. Okay. Eileen actually said that um, was, it was the best episode of Voyager. She said it reminded her a lot of um, the Romans and the River Styx. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, so. lost souls across the river of blood or whatever. Yep. Yeah, there's this very uh, oh mythical, mythological, or what's the right? Um, uh, yes, there's 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 sort of a gosh, I don't know what how would you put it a godlike quality to a character like that, a mythological figure, mm-hmm. uh, and that then you know that you're in a you're doing something that has a huge impact and a, a lot of responsibility actually to the narrative in terms of the civilization the culture definitely and like i said i mean that that's a powerful character the first klingon who murdered the gods that created him i mean you don't get much yeah. more powerful than that um so circle back to enterprise because any chance I get to circle back to Enterprise is a good one for me. But I'm um, actually this was this was actually something that I was thinking about as well. Um, now you and Gary didn't have any scenes together, even though you were both in Terra Prime. But um, did you get a chance to go up to him and go ha ha ha? Now you're the one that has to sit through makeup. Did you ever? I'm just so angry they didn't stick him in like some huge bucket head. You know, <laughs> really, I'm just <laughs> I can't tell you. It's just not right. Uh, you know. <laughs> He says, oh, I'm going into makeup. I'm like, no, you're not. I mean, there's that. what did you get? A couple of ears, maybe? And a wig. I, yeah. So that's it. Yeah, this cute little wig and a couple of ears. <laughs> I, anyway, I made fun of him. Uh, we, unfortunately, we, didn't, we weren't in the same scene. So usually when that happens, it's, it, your call time might be different. You show up on the set at a different right. time, different day, you know. So, yeah. You know, maybe there, there's hope. I'm hoping someday that, you know, he gets to play – yeah, you know, some kind of elef- elephant man brain dead kind of. <laughs> so you can really get to know what it felt like to be you yeah. for the, all those years. He has no idea. <laughs> um, that that actually has no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
that actually leads me to something very interesting. Um, I went to Big Apple Comic Con uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, William Shatner was there, and I went to his panel, and somebody had asked him a question about, you know, working on Boston Legal and what it was like to work with James Spader. Um, and again, David E. Kelly, one of my favorites. But, um, you know, Bill had said along the lines of, you know, it wraps and you're sad to see it end and everybody sits around going, oh, no, no, we'll call, we'll call, we'll do lunch, we'll do lunch. And then it never happens, you know, and Bill just says, you know, this is this is a life in television, you know, you're like family for the, the time that you're shooting a series, but when it's over, you kind of lose touch. Now, do you agree with that or are you still friends with anybody that you've done Alien Nation with? Well, I okay, yes, uh, Alien Nation, as well as uh, some of the same actors and uh, directors, uh, writers from Hot Pursuit, which also worked on Alien Nation. Uh, we have a special thing. Uh, I I I don't know what like the you know the star, regular Star Trek leads, uh, how they live their lives or who they connect with. Sure. You know, uh, you know, do they? hang out or do they like see each other every now and then at their own private reunions. So in alien nation, um, we had such a good time that we would have our own little alien nation sort of reunion parties. Uh, we would also like some of the writers there are writing other shows. Uh, and once in a while we might get a shot at one of those because they, we had such a good working relationship. Ken Johnson, who was the executive producer, um, to this day, we, you know, see each other once in a while and, um, you know, he's he, really, he's just like, you know, they're like family, Terry trees, uh, Michelle Scarabelli, Gary, uh, we, we all kind of like, we, we connect every now and then just enough to know that we're still, we still love each other. You know, that's some, hopefully that doesn't sound corny, but we do. <laughs> You know, but we we really do. Now, other shows that I've done, for example, I was on a year of uh, fame. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a couple of actors that I've heard from uh, on fame. for That was like 1985 or six or something. Oh, you're going to make wow. me go back and look? Yeah, okay. Go go way back, way <laughs> back in the time machine. Uh, so then, uh, like Heart of Dixie... Uh, peripherally, I've um, heard from a couple of people. Uh, there was a one episode I did called Six on the History Channel, which was about SEAL Team Six. I only did one episode, and that was a few years ago. Those actors are tight. I see that they are still connecting with each other because they had a, a really uh, powerfully intense experience what they went through i mean they went through their own boot camp and uh i played the dad of one of the leads in that and i like seeing them pop up on their social media and we kind of say hello every now and then and connect um so it absolutely can um stick with you and i think it's great that it does i i imagine there are a few people in the original star trek uh, that that do. Um, I know that, you know, like William Shatner is doing the convention circuit, so he must run into George Takai and others. Yep. Uh, and um, they, I'm sure, talk in a friendly way. They maybe not, maybe they're not going to each other's weddings, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, right. you know, they're, but they're, uh, I mean that was a that was a groundbreaking show, uh, huge, uh, like such a change of television that show. Yeah. So I I think that they probably uh, have like you know a, a legacy. So, sure. Yeah. A uh, fame by the way was eighty six eighty seven. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So yeah, that was the way back machine. I do. I watched Fame too. So. But, I mean, honestly, I think the role for me that, that really kind of burned Eric Pierpoint into into my memory would definitely have to be Alien Nation. It was such a, such a fantastic show. Um, but Eileen mentioned this, and I we were getting there as soon as we got through the Star Trek stuff. I definitely want to talk about what you're doing now, which includes Eric Pierpoint. 
Eric Pierpoint, the author. So, okay, um, I I started writing a number of years ago. I wrote a. Um, I was asked if I had an idea for a western, and of course I do. Uh, my whole family, you know, like migrated on the Oregon Trail in the eighteen hundreds. And I had diaries, and so I wrote a, a screenplay that was optioned uh, by Stars Entertainment for the Hallmark Channel. And this was, uh, I don't know, uh, I want to say like 10 years ago or something. And <clears throat> Hallmark was, they were at the brink, I guess, of making the decision to, to do it, but they stopped doing their, their movies of the week. So the option came back to me, and my manager said, uh, Eric, why don't you turn this into a novel? And I said, you got to be freaking kidding me. That's a lot of work. Uh, yeah, write it, write like a YA or kind of a younger reader, you know. I went, well, let me think about it. Well, I said, okay, I'll write 50 pages. Yeah, okay, if you write 50 pages, I'll get it read by, you know, an agent. So I wrote it. The agent read it. She rejected it, but she gave me really good feedback and some ideas. I reimagined it from the point of view of a uh, seasoned uh, gunfighter to a 12-year-old boy. And so I said, okay, let, I can, I'm an actor. I can take direction. So give me, you know, give me some ideas about what you think in terms of structure and all that. Well, she did, and... Uh, I said, if I write the next 50 pages, will you read it? Yes, I will. Okay. I stuck my dog in the car and we drove everywhere for like a month. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And I handed it in to her when I got back and looked at, you know, I talked to historians. I took photographs. I, you know, wrote by rivers and mountains. And, and I wanted to see what, what the pioneers had actually seen. And so she read it. She went, oh, wow, you can do this. When can I have the whole book? This was November of that year. And, and she says, can I have it by the first of the year? I said, you want me to write 200 pages in like two months, less than two months? Yeah, can you do that? No. Uh, give me till February 1st. So I wrote it, and I handed it in to her. And she says, oh, wow, you can do this. I'm going to represent it. She found a publisher. Uh, well, first she said rewrite it, so I did. But she found a publisher, and he loved it. And he said, "Okay, now I'll rewrite it." So, anyway, a couple of years later, I finally had uh, a draft that they were going to publish. That led to a book deal, and then the next book became a uh, historical fiction uh, adventure, a uh, revolutionary war. And I, once again, I went on location. I feel like going on location, you're like a private investigator. You can get in there and really, you know, unearth all of this information. And visually, you can see all of this stuff. And it's just sort of like you fall in love with your story. And you unearth these nuggets. So that launched me on a career, a side career, not side, but another career. So in addition to being an actor, of going and doing school visits, bringing in the books, doing presentations for middle grade readers, which are like, you know, say 9 to 13 years old, 8 to 13. And uh, I got had so much fun. The first one won the Best of the West Book Award, and the next one had a really great, um, you know, critical uh, reviews from company uh, organization called Kirkus. And now I'm working on books three and four. Uh, and uh, so that keeps me really, really busy. In fact, probably a little bit too busy. Uh, and so I'd like to then uh, also get back into, you know, in front of the camera. And it's sort of like, a, it's not that they're necessarily these two careers are competing they kind of go together because as actors we are first and foremost you know storytellers and that definitely influences uh my my writing uh, in terms of how as actors we have these rhythms of of we understand story and um when to dig deeper and when to get off of something um so that helps me 
And that's that's kind of what my life is about these days, plus a new dog. <laughs> yes, we were, we were talking earlier about we're both incredible animal lovers, and you have um, Cola. That's yes. her name? Yes. And she's... Cola. She's yeah. Been with, yeah, go ahead. She's been with you how long? Uh, I got her uh, 13 months ago. I picked her up in Montana. She's a puppy. She was uh, just a little thing up there. She's My sister runs the Humane Society in Missoula, Montana. So she kept sending me photos. And finally, I she sent me a photo of a puppy I couldn't delete. Hmm. And so I drove up. There was five below zero up there. I picked her up. And, uh, you know, brought her back, and she's a, a real sweetheart. She's, of course, a total handful. She's a lot of different dogs. I did the DNA test. It's like they dropped the sample on the floor and rubbed it around, and I ended up with, like, eight different dogs that was part wolf. Um, but she looks kind of like a golden husky, as I would describe her. Um, very cheerful. She thinks every living thing on the planet is all for her. Um, you know how that is. You have a dog. Yes, I do. And he, and especially because he's 13, going on 14, he's old man, pay attention to me, feed me. Yeah, he's definitely all about himself in his old age. He feels like he's earned it. Well, he has earned it. My dog, last dog lived to be 16. And he was a, you know, a kind of a Malamute Husky Shepherd mix, 85 pounds. Uh, such a love. I took him everywhere on these research trips and all that. And uh, so he's, uh, the spirit of Joey is around the house, and now I have the spirit of Cola, which in Native American Sioux, uh, Lakota language, means friend. And so she's off the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation in Montana, so I named her friend. Um, Yeah, um, our mutual friend Asher, who's the one that, that put us together so that you could come and do this with me. Um, when we were talking about it, I went and checked out your website at, at one point, and I remember seeing a picture, I guess it was of Joey, and I said something to Asher about how gorgeous the dog was, and he's like, yeah, he's not with us anymore. And I was like, oh. You know what? It's like he's he is and he isn't. Um, right, right. You do. Like, okay, like every year after eight years old, I was saying you have to give me like five more years. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I've... I. You know, Anakin, like I said, he's going on 14, but I've had cats that, you know, have, have come and gone in my life, and sometimes I still feel like they're around. So. And you can kind of see them. I have stones with my cats' uh, names carved into them in the garden area. Aww. Right now I have Frankie, who's looking to jump up on the table here to, you know, hang out with us. <laughs> uh, I got him when I went grocery shopping uh, the year Obama was elected, and um, I walked into a Petco that was next door to the grocery store and I came home with a cat. Well, I have um, Kalal, who is one of my cats, and I've, I've nicknamed him. He's the producer of the podcast because he always likes to come in and check in on me. And Sometimes he sits on my lap, but I found that he tends to get into the microphone or he digs his nails into my lap at the most inopportune times. Oh, um, yeah, so right now he's actually on the back of the desk chair. So as long as, but yeah, he's definitely the producer of the podcast because he's always like checking up on me, making sure everything's going well. You should do. You should have like a Star Trek cat lover show. <laughs> actually, I have what the last cat that I adopt. I was not adopting. I wasn't looking for any cats. And the woman that gave me Kalel, he's um, he's FIV positive, and. So she knows that I know how to, you know, look out for an FIV positive cat. For those of you that don't know, there's a feline version of AIDS. Um, but as long as the cat's healthy, he's healthy. And Kalel's fine. And um, she's like, I have another FIV cat and I can't keep him. And would you mind taking him? And I'm like, I don't need another cat. And then she sent me this. And, he's, and I'm like, I need a cat that's named after a Star Trek yes. character. Because I have Anakin, who's obviously Anakin Skywalker. I have Kalel, who's you know for Superman. So my last fandom that needed to be represented in in animals was cat. So I have Reed, as in Lieutenant Reed. So, well, you know, well, you need a Harris. I need a you know, yeah. So now I'm gonna have to go out and get another cat. Is that what you're saying? Seven cats, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and he's gonna be blonde with spots. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. So he can look. He can look ten Chinese, but I'll name him Harris. Exactly. As long as he's not eaten. Never mind. Exactly. And he'll, he'll he'll eat sour milk. Maybe I don't. Maybe. <laughs> somebody. No, you know what aliens are going to eat? You know. Well, you know, it was just it was funny because somebody I when I was posting about this podcast, somebody one of their responses to you, and, and there I don't know if you saw the little collage I put together. Um, of pictures, but George was one of the was one of the pictures, and the guy and the and the response was, wasn't he in that that show about alien? However you put it, that show about aliens or whatever. It's like, yeah, Alien Nation, and the response to that was, isn't that the show where they drank sour milk? Yes, uh, yes. I was like, men had, had babies. I okay. said that was a weird freaking thing when you get a script and you go, wait a minute, I'm having the baby. <laughs> And you needed, and you needed Albert. You you needed him to be the catalyst. Let's get into like a threesome <laughs> with the Ganom, Benom, Albert kid guy, whatever, and then then we'll have the baby after my wife has been completely satisfied by two of us. Yeah, exactly. And then wasn't there a point where the baby comes out of your body and goes into the, like that cocoon? Well, now what happens is that uh, Michelle Scarabelli, her character Susan. She carries the baby for a while in a pod, okay? The transferring of the pod then happens, and George, me, puts it in his, like, marsupial pouch. Right. It then goes to term. And this snaky-looking thing goes up and attaches itself to George's nipple. Now he's got to run around and chase the bad guys with a gun. Well, he is like 97 months pregnant or something, like enormous, and catches the bad guy, but in the process goes into labor. So, of course, they have to have like an incredibly private moment where Sykes helps George deliver the baby uh, on a gym floor. And uh, you talk about two men bonding hmm. as never before. <laughs> Vesna. The baby's name was Vesna. Vesna. You can actually Google the Alien Nation birth scene <laughs> on YouTube. So when I want to horrify, I teach a film class for a university. And once in a while, just to mess with them, I will put this, I will make them watch the birth scene from Alien Nation. Oh, when my they, gosh. What, what what kind of weird stuff have you done in your career, Professor Eric? <laughs> <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Good luck with that, you guys. Well, uh, see, well, you and see, and now you and Connor Trenier have something in common because one of the very first episodes of Enterprise, Connor got pregnant. Trip Trip Tucker got pregnant. No way! I did not know that. There was, I think, it was like the third episode. They that you know they're out there, they're exploring the galaxy for you know the first time, and they they meet this. This species and their ship, they're, they're having sh issues with their ship. And, you know, Archer being the, we're out here to make friends with everybody. Let me send you our engineer. Maybe he can help you. And, of course, he goes over there and he falls for the female. They, they were actually bald, too. Fell for this female and she takes him on. They have a hollow deck and she takes him on the hollow deck. And they're in this little boat and they put their hands inside this ball of, of crystals. And they're making nice and nothing really happens you know that that trip thinks everything's okay and he comes back on board and it turns out he's pregnant because hello because the, right. the males of their species carry the babies and then turn them over to the females and of course now they've got to go all over the place trying to find these people to give the baby back flocks is having the time of his life going <laughs> okay but trip actually grew nipples on the insides of his arm no, what? Oh my God! What? And he had to draw, and he had to wear, he had to wear a shirt to cover. Oh, and he was having emotional fits. And he's on the, he was on the little, the little lift in engineering, and he's complaining it's not safe for somebody could fall. His hormones are going all over the place. He's having okay. nesting issues and hormone issues. But the best part was when they ran into the Klingons and had to explain the whole thing to them to not get the Klingons to blow them up. And the yeah, that, that was like explaining this to Gary Graham. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'll have to say.
send you the name of the episode if you if you have Netflix and you have oh, time. Please you have to... email me that. I am going to look that. Up. I'm going to watch it tonight because that is hysterical. I get it because I, I, the wonderful thing about science fiction and Star Trek and is is the invention, you know. Mm-hmm. And when you get stuff like that, it's like actors' gold. You you can't get that right. I mean, it's just the best when you get to do something that's way outside of the box. Absolutely. Yeah, you get to stretch. You get and the to, thing you, is, I I flew home from a con in in uh, in uh, the London area, I think, uh, and he never mentioned that to me. <laughs> we had you guys could have bonded stuff. over that. We had all of this in common. We could have like talked for thousands of miles. Oh my gosh! Well, you know, if I go, I'll have to try and remember when I'm in Vegas. I'll have to be like Connor. I can't believe that you and Eric didn't bond over being pregnant. <laughs> God, that's so weird. That is going to be the first thing I say. To him. I love it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Do you still do conventions at all? Are you still like? I, uh, I was asked if I'd be interested in going to Las Vegas this year. Uh, so that may happen. I'm not sure at this point. There's no real uh, firm commitment on it. But it'd be really f- kind of fun to go uh, again for a couple of days, you know. Eric, yeah. come on, just to just to walk up and say that to Connor. Oh, that'd be worth it, right there. It'd be right? Worth it. Yes. You're, let, show me your nipples under your arms. <laughs> That's it. Just walk up to him and be like, "I hear you have nipples on your arm. Let me see them." I'll, I'll show you my stretch marks from my pouch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yes, and I just—you just have to let me know when you're going to do it because we have to record the whole thing. We have to like stream it or something. Just we'll f- sneak it in there. Just do it like a secret thing, you know. Yes. Oh, that. Would- <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this already. Oh, we are- a- you got to do it. We definitely have to do this. Um. Yeah, Eileen. Yes, it, she is right. Um, it is. It's episode five. I knew it was right in the very beginning. It's called Unexpected, which makes sense. First year on the in the first year. It, yeah, it's it's season one, episode five, Unexpected. I will watch it. You have to watch. You have to email me and tell me what you think. But yeah, it's a great episode. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> oh, Robert said you can exchange baby pics. That's funny. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do that. Um, well, well Esther's out of college now, so I don't know where she is. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Does she not keep in touch? Uh, you know how they are. Yeah, once they're out on their own. You know, she's just asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> I never hear from you unless you... Does she know how to use Skype? Does she Skype me her money? I should ask, you know. She only comes home twice a year, and that's to get me on board with all this tech stuff. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think um, we are good on questions. Oh, there is one thing before I forget. I, pr- I should have done this at the top of the show, but before I forget, um, I did mention something last week, and I, I have a correction to make. Um, I said Doug Drexler had written Trouble with Tribbles, and that is not true. Patrick Goodman was kind enough to correct me on Twitter, um, and it is David Gerald who wrote Trouble with Trick. Trouble with Tribbles, um, Drexler designed the NX-01. Now, I should be really ashamed of myself. I should have really known the difference between Doug and David since um, Drexler's the one that designed the NX-01. But anyway, I did want to throw that out there before I forgot because it is a correction, and I've always promised that if somebody corrects if somebody corrects me, I will definitely publicly apologize to the masses that I got something Star Trek wrong. So, sorry. Um, but Eric, this has been amazing. Uh, really a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm amazed at how much uh, there's this whole world that I've been a part of, mm-hmm. that uh, all of your, you and your and the fans and your, your callers and every, you know, the people who are listening to us, I just want them to know how much I appreciate it, you know, They're connecting like this. I, I really do. I feel like it, in a sense, you know, you go by, we're actors, we tell stories, we're hired to do this, but yet there, I've always respected the fact that there are people out there who make this a huge part uh, of their of their lives, you know? And, um, you know, it's a good, it's such a great, it's an honor, really, to kind of, like, be in this profession in that way. Now, if somebody wants to purchase your books, uh, I notice they are available on Amazon. Yeah, they just go on Amazon, look me up, and they'll come up with stuff. 
Now, I just want to say, um, plug, because I'm a huge believer in this, but if you go to smile.amazon.com, it is literally the same site except that every purchase that you make, um, Amazon will donate to a charity of your choice. Oh, cool. So if you're going to go purchase anything, especially an Eric Purepoint novel, please go to smile.amazon.com, and it will let you pick your charity. I personally donate to the Christopher Reeve Foundation every time I make a purchase on Amazon. You do. Aww. Yeah, and it's not it's not it's not added to your purchase price. It's just something Amazon does. If you make a purchase through smile.amazon, Amazon kicks in a percentage of whatever your purchase is. What what uh interested you in to the donate to that? Um I Christopher Reeve, I saw not to date myself, but I did actually see Superman in some original theatrical release. And I literally just fell in love with Christopher Reeve. I mean, you want to talk about somebody that followed somebody from everything that they've done? Uh, that was me. I just, I just fell in love. I mean, six four, black hair, blue eyes. I just. Well, uh, listen. I used to play racquetball with him in New York a lot. Oh wow! And we would go into the gym and work out, and he was enormous. <laughs> right? He, yeah. I mean, he beefed up. I mean, he was. He really. I mean, there was no padding when it came to Superman. That was all him. Well, he was such a good guy, and we had a blast. Um, and this was, um, gosh, when did, that was like 1980, um, yeah, in the early 80s, I right. would say, in New York. And uh, I will only say that because he was so big, racquetball was not his one number one sport. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to be, like, live. You have to be small and quick, I think. Exactly, right, right. Yeah. But it was. Really, every time we played, it was really just funny. Such a gentleman and such a good guy and a wonderful guy and so perfect for Superman. Don't yeah, you? yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, – um, Brandon Roush was terrible. Um, but Henry Cavill, um, from a standpoint of looks and mannerisms, I think he was a good choice to take over when they decided to, you know, reboot the whole superhero franchise. But, um, no, Christopher Reeve will always be Superman to me. Um, I actually had a chance to see him speak uh, when I was living in State College. Uh, he went. To, he was on his speaking tour uh, not too long before he died, um, and I got to see him at Penn State. So I actually got to hear him speak, um, and I've read both of his books. And, um, yeah, so when it, comes to, when it comes to a charity to donate to, it's, it's all about the Christopher Reeve Foundation. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. And that's I, I think that's amazing. I didn't I didn't realize that you you knew him, so that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, I, we there were a few of us that kind of traveled in similar you know circles over mm-hmm. New York and back in the day, and it was just coincidence that we got together and you know it was really fun. You know. Well, then I, I have to ask you before I let you go. What about Robin Williams? Because I know he and Chris were such amazing friends. So well, that never went into the connection that that okay. To, Agree, you know, it was mainly, hey, you you want to play, you know, next Monday or whatever. Oh no, I, I just thought maybe you would cross paths with him as well, since he and Chris no, were I, such. No, I didn't. Uh, no, I didn't. But um, uh, that would have been. <laughs> I would love that too. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love the story about how Robin Williams was just so amazing when Chris got hurt. Um, basically, when his insurance was running out, Robin Williams is like, whatever you need. Yeah. And he was one of the first people to come see him in the hospital. It's such an incredible tragedy. You know, it's just so sickening. Yeah. We lived through that. Very hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, sorry to be ending on such a somber note, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and, and out of love. I mean, you bring well, him up because it's sort of like you, it's, you know, a hail fellow well met. You know, it's well, like, that's true. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I, uh, Tony Todd and he worked together one of the last projects that he did, and I actually have it on DVD called um, Black Fox. I suppose they were trying to make um it was a mini series they were hoping to turn into a TV series and Tony Todd actually had some wonderful stories about him too when I met when I met him a couple years ago so there um, you go. yeah yeah it's always nice to hear good stories about people you know they say never meet your heroes so it's always nice to hear good stories about people that you know that you've idolized from afar for as long as I have the thing you think and want think about Chris is you know you keep thinking it because he was that kind of a guy. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. 
Um, Eric, thank you again so much for joining me. Uh, I am Sammy Kay, and this has been, once again, the NX7062 podcast. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at NX7062. You can email me at NX7062 at Comcast.net, and you can find us on Facebook, uh, the NX7062 podcast. Um, again, just ideas for shows, guests that you want me to try and track down and have on Um or anything, anything you want to say, corrections that you think I need to make. Um, maybe if you want to find out what Eric thought of Unexpected, <laughs> you can reach out to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, um, but again, thank you, Eric, for joining me. And thank you both, Eileen and Robert, for joining me. And thank you, everybody out there in social media land who gave me uh, questions to ask. And I hope everybody has a great week. And I will catch you all again soon. <laughs>